Marianne Davison, and I'm the vicar of St. Bede's Episcopal Church in Port Orchard, Washington. And I'm here right now to talk to you about a model called Elements of an Organizational System. So I have two children. Um, one is going to turn six on Wednesday of Holy Week. Uh, the other is two and a half, and he just started in the potty training class, so this is huge for our family. Uh, so when my older son started at preschool, this is him, Ujin, you're just going to have to imagine that that's him. The way you should be able to tell it's him, or I could, is that his hair is terrible because I cut it myself. <laughs> um, and so you can see, you can imagine a kid with really um, mom cut hair. So the, the daycare that we enrolled him in when he was about two uh, was actually the daycare at a church plant. Uh, it's a Lutheran church. Uh, and the model for this congregation is they started, the pastor started by creating a daycare. Uh, and a community around the daycare. So they staff the daycare, and then income from that actually is income that goes into the church. So it's a nonprofit daycare, and it's a worshiping community. Uh, and then later, they built a building. And so they have a church building. It's actually like right across from an elementary school. So in addition to littles being there, kids who are toddlers um, or infants, uh, they also have kids after school or before school who go to the school across the street. So downstairs, in addition to a room that's a food pantry, there's the different daycare rooms, uh, and they, it looks like just a daycare. Um, but if you go upstairs during the week, what you'll see is a big room with all these movable toy furniture things and lots of toys, and there's a kitchen, uh, and the big kids hang out up there. It's also where they have chapel on Wednesday mornings. On Friday, the staff break down the big kid area and turn it into church. They set it up for chairs for about 100 people, uh, and they make church in, in the altar, or in the sanctuary around the altar. Um, and so really, they have built their whole life as a worshiping community, actually, around the mission of accompanying kids and families as they develop. And the building reflects that. So it happened, I came to town and I was uh, new to town when I took my call and I said to my fellow pastor, so who has an opening at your daycare? And one of them said, I do. And so that's how we ended up there. So when I enrolled him, I got a parent handbook. It had um, all the costs, um, all of the procedures, how they would handle discipline if kids acted out, what the days were, what the times, all of the stuff that you would expect. But it helped orient me to what I was supposed to do with my kid in this place, right? It told me all the information I needed to know. And as we entered the school, we really enjoyed it. And both of my boys have really enjoyed being there. Um, so the kids in class change, right? So my son's in a class. The one who's potty training, he just moved into a new class. So there's different kids in each class. And those kids, they actually have relationships. So some of them are friends, but some of them are probably frenemies, if I'm being quite honest. I hang out enough to know which is which. I try to as a mom. But they have relationships with each other that impact what happens in class. You know, so day to day, the kids come home and they're either really happy about those relationships or not. So I know it's not always the same. It changes over time. Another thing I've really appreciated about this place is the teachers who have been just really great and consistent, um, not, not just caring for the kids and making sure they don't kill each other, but really trying to teach them shapes and loving them and feeding them and worshiping with them, and it's fantastic. They recently actually got a new director who had been the teacher. They had a director who everyone really loved, and she moved on to something big and great and new, and then they called someone who was not a good fit. Um, actually, one day, there was, everyone was all a flutter because she had taken the big kids away before chapel to go to school to just play on the playground. And that was like, quite upsetting, actually. <laughs> so there's teachers. Now the director is actually really great. She was somebody who was a teacher before. So 
these are kind of things that I would say I can tell what the impacts are on this kid of these things. Like I can see how it's nurtured my boys uh, to be a part of this community. Now, like if you have kids, you know though, like there's things about um, families that creep into the classroom. Right? So there's some kids early on in my son's class who were being fostered. Um, there were some kids in my son's class whose parents uh, were really poor. Um, and these are things we might intuit, but they're also things you can learn, right? So, and there's things that we can't control, right? So I can't control, or the teacher can't control who's having broken relationships at home. They can't control the economic situation at home. It's just a thing that's happening in these kids' environment that can't be controlled, but it does impact everybody else, right? And sometimes things happen in the church that affect this stuff, even though it might not seem obviously that it would. Like, um, they're calling a new pastor. The pastor who is developing the congregation left. So even though she helped kind of get them to a place where financially it wasn't as problematic, um, now they're in a place where there's some transition in the congregation, and at least to some anxiety and feelings of change. So something that I have noticed is that it doesn't take very much to throw a toddler's day off. Really, any kind of change is enough to send us into a tailspin. Uh, and so something as simple as like, it rains one day. Okay. So it rains one day. Uh, what that means when it rains is that the kids can go outside and play. And the parent handbook says the kids go outside and play at least two hours every day. Right. What happens when the kids can't go out inside and play is sometimes kids who like each other aren't as nice to each other. Right. Um, sometimes when it rains or there's a weather event, like if the power goes out, teachers and the director have to scramble to call the parents to pick up the kids because you can't watch kids when there's no power. A thing to notice then for me as a parent is actually that any there's some things I can't control about this environment. And not only that, any one element of this can actually change the experience of my son, of his class. Um, and they affect each other, right? You wouldn't think that necessarily rain is gonna cause kids to hit each other. That's not, may not be intuitive to you, but it turns out if kids expect to go outside and they have a lot of energy and there's one toy that they're both interested in, wow, that can happen because these things are connected, right? They actually are connected. All of these things are. Um, the teachers uh, have some, they understand that it's a church, that it's not a regular school. Um, they use the handbook. Um, the building references the places. All of these things are related and they all affect each other. The model elements of an organizational system is meant to represent how connected these things are. So if you're following along in your book, you'll see definitions for each of these. Uh, but notice first that this is a system. Right? So this is depicted as a closed system, right? There's a culture and climate. I can draw a boundary around it. And this culture and climate within it, there's these specific elements of an organization. So one of them is the leadership. Uh, for us in church, that may be the clergy leader. It also is lay leaders. It's leaders of specific ministries. It's even spiritual mentors or people who teach. But anyone who's exercising leadership um, has an effect on the system. Likewise, leaders and organizations employ strategies toward their goals. So in the case of my son's class, part of the strategy of the organization is to build church around a daycare, around families and kids, right? It changes how they do other stuff. They don't do, they don't have the same church building that I have at St. Pete's because they have a different mission, right? They are related to one another. There are also um, 
besides the strategy, specific structures. And by this, we mean both physical structures. It could be our church building or plant, but they could also be other structures, roles that we take on um, as we function within our organizational system, congregation. There are also dynamics. Um, this is related to this. But people, when we talk about this within an organizational system, it really is about which people are there, how many, what gifts, talents, and skills do they have that they're bringing to bear on the organization. Dynamics, we mean it's about people. It's interpersonal, actually, dynamics. But it's about the emotional field between those people. So those are different things. Who we are and how we function with one another are different things. So there's people. And then there's dynamics between people. There are also specific processes that we've learned as an organization help us be effective, adapt to change. So those processes then are another part of this matrix of how we function together. Here it says culture and climate. And like, um, like here, the calling the new pastor affects all of these other things. The culture and climate is really how we feel. Like, how do we feel about our organization? Is it positive or negative? What are the unspoken values that affect the congregation that maybe are not just strategies or espoused values, structures, or processes? All of those things are contained within the system. And the system is not merely an island. It's separate from its environment, but it is affected by its environment. Just like a kid who comes to school hungry is going to have a different experience of the class than a kid who comes to school with a belly full, um, our environment impacts what we can do inside of our organization, how effective we can be, uh, how faithful. So then, we have a really complex system. All of these little marks are supposed to represent how each of these different elements has the potential to impact any other. You might also have noticed there's some little dots I drew in. Um, this is kind of an ad. It's not in your book, so I can get in trouble if I'm going to get in trouble with that one. The dots are actually about the culture and the climate. So a thing about an organizational system, uh, and we, when we talk about conflict and culture uh, in other parts of our curriculum, we note that every organization, including your congregation, has um, anxiety, has energy that's spread out inside of it. it it's normal to have that, actually. Uh, and so when we think of culture and climate, sometimes we want to paint a really rosy picture of our organization, and we should actually celebrate everything good about our organization. So we should also be honest that, you know, sometimes people have bad days. Sometimes our structures aren't helping us. Our walls might be falling down. Sometimes our processes have stopped working. Sometimes our leadership is tired or sick. Um, and what can happen if we're not paying attention to how these things impact one another is that sometimes anxiety can start to focus on one part of the system. Yeah, that sounds terrible, right? It sounds scary, and it should. If you've ever been the person that's been the focus of anxiety in your congregation, it just sounds that terrible in your head. Um, so a thing that sometimes happens and this might be natural for us, is that we might focus our attention on one part of the system. So if things aren't going well at church, if the numbers have shrunk and the budget's down and we have to let someone go, a thing that might naturally happen is we might say, what is the problem? What can I fix? And I might say to myself, you know, if we just had a better process for dealing with this, all of our problems would be over. Or if I just get rid of that one person, our church is going to be friendly and welcoming again. But that is not what this model suggests. What this model suggests is actually when we encounter challenges that push on one part of our organizational structure, um, the reality of how it's experienced and how it's expressed, it doesn't always, it's not always the symptom. So while our anxiety might be around a person, what really might be going on 
is that you change the locks to the sacristy and now somebody doesn't have a key. It's not that that person is cranky. It might be actually you did something that you did not intend to affect another part of the system that really did and was really hurtful and hard. So elements of an organizational system is a way we can stop and actually think through how our systems are functioning, how our, how our system as an integrated whole is working. So, before we think of some more specific examples then, the key ideas around elements of an organizational system are that all of the elements are connected and they all affect each other. You can't take one part out um, and, and expect that the system will actually um, not try and get back to the shape it is. Like I can take a person out, but actually what's going to happen is that that's going to pull everything else in a different direction until we get back to stasis what we want. We want to be healthy and, and, and individuated and, and redistribute our anxiety in a way that feels good. And so all of these elements are co uh, connected and they all affect each other. The other thing that's critical to this model, and we'll talk about more when we think about um, systems, uh, organizations as systems, and self-differentiated leadership, is that organizations are a system which means they are not just the sum of their parts. You cannot take one of these parts out and analyze it separately from the others because they all pull and interact with each other. So this is a more holistic way to think about what's happening in the life of our congregation than just focusing on leadership or having a better strategic plan. The other thing that's really important about this model is that this is really a way to analyze and plan interventions in our system or changes that are happening. So if you, you could actually use this if you are planning to make a change to think through in advance what the implications might be. And I've made reference to some unanticipated impacts of changes. But you could also say, hmm, I'm planning on changing the locks to the sacristy door. Um, does that relate at all to our strategy as a congregation? Maybe we actually want to be welcoming, so I should think about access to the church building and how I may or may not be creating barriers to people using the space and exercising their ministry. I might think about which people had keys before um, and who might want them because they're doing that ministry. I might think, are those people people who um, trust me or not? That's our relational dynamic, right? So if I really don't want to get caught unawares, I could use this to think that through. So that, though, might be not as concrete as would be helpful for some. So uh, I wanted to talk to somebody uh, who had a change that maybe impacted different parts of the organization. So Chris Cron, um, I know that you and your congregation um, or a sanctuary church. Could you tell me what that sanctuary church status means? Maybe stand up. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a sanctuary church is one that is willing to provide a safe space for someone who is at risk for deportation without due process. And so we would um, open our doors and provide residence for someone as their process um, goes through. Okay. So why why did the congregation become a sanctuary church? Well, in 2012, we became an immigrant welcoming congregation. And so we went through a whole process of conversation with outside facilitators and did forums and created an immigrant welcoming congregation committee. We had goals. Uh, we really included all of the leadership uh, that was important for that to happen. In 2012, we decided on becoming an immigrant welcoming congregation, but we did not go so far as to say that we would become a sanctuary church. But then our strategy was that three years later we would revisit that topic. But two and a half years later, <laughs> someone was in need of sanctuary and we were called on. And so this strategy got pulled in a different way. And we had to once again re-enter a process that we really thought that we had already figured out. Um, we had, and so we had a task force that said this is what it would look like for us to be a sanctuary church. Uh, we did more conversations. We preached about it. 
And what we did not revisit so much was around the people and dynamics. So when it came for a vote on Vestry, there was an opportunity for everyone to go around and say what their hesitations were and where they were um, on a, a gradient of agreement to becoming a sanctuary church. Um, but somebody was really shut out of that conversation on Vestry. And, and was not um, in a place that they were ready to share what was really going on. And so the vestry just became angry with that person and said that their reasons for not becoming a sanctuary church were invalid or mean or inhospitable. Um, and so it shifted this entire web here. And what happened was that we did go on. This person um, did not vote. Um, they abstained from the vote. And so we had... Um, everyone else voted, and it, and it went, and we it passed. We became a sanctuary church, but this person left the vestry, mm -hmm. and so it shifted again. The, the dynamics of the vestry, um, the structures, everything really was pulled and tugged on. And what was important from the leadership side was for me to really seek this person out and re re uh, maintain and reconnect that relationship. Yeah. And this person is still involved in our congregation, and so that, that has a happy ending. <laughs> Um, but it really did pull in different ways that were unexpected. Right. So, so as a leader, then, because you were aware that actually it might not be a problem with one person, there, there are some things that happened that impacted that person's behavior, that you could then take that high-level view um, and choose a different strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's a great example of how to use this. Um, before we move to... The checklist of how to use this. Does anybody have any other thoughts about elements of organizational system? Anything really important? All right. So then, let's move on to how to use this. So this is, um, as I mentioned, a really excellent tool for assessment and diagnosis um, because it gives us really a chance to take that big picture view. It can be hard when. Uh, how we experience our congregation, we tend to think of it as spirit and um, relationship or family, but actually there's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside our church. Um, and so being able to name the different elements helps us better assess and create strategies that are gonna work. Um, teaching information, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, I think it's a little dry for uh, most congregations to tell you the <laughs> truth. So I would, I mean, I would only teach it to key leaders, but I probably wouldn't teach it in a class. Um, I think it is good for data collection, at least for the leadership level, to be able to dig through. Um, it's really a data sorting kind of way. Um, you're, you have that data, but this helps you sort it so that you can analyze it holistically instead of atomistically as parts. Um, Likewise, I'm not sure this is great for development of common language, unless maybe you have a congregation of all CEOs and business types who love this stuff. Probably not. It is great for leadership and strategy. I mean, leadership and strategy are right in it. So obviously, they're, I mean, we are really, but I mean that not in a joking way, but really, leadership and strategy are critical to the model because we understand how they're related to other things. So you better use this for leadership and strategy. Likewise, it can be helpful for direction, vision, and goals, um, particularly if you have a big question, like becoming a sanctuary church, and you're, you're trying to figure out how to um, set goals or accomplish it, given that you're aware that it's gonna have impacts that you don't anticipate. So with that, um, I've been Ariane Davison, <laughs> and this is uh, the elements of an organizational system. Mm -hmm.